Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Atlanta. Excited to be here with you this afternoon. I'm Hunter Muller, lead principal at HMG Strategy. I think this might be we're going on our 20th summit in Atlanta with our friends, our good friends from uh, the state of Georgia and uh, Atlanta. Love coming down to Atlanta. Uh, next best thing is to do it digitally. So really excited about a brilliant genius agenda here today. So let's get rolling. A big shout out to our partners today, Arctic Wolf, Espressive, and Rimney Street. Really appreciate your support. Without you, we couldn't do what we do. When they reach out, when the key rep reaches out to you, please take a meeting and learn for 20 or 30 minutes what they're doing uniquely different today uh, in the enterprise, delivering value and delivering an impact. And uh, a highlighted uh, partner of ours, a new partner, Arctic Wolf. Arctic Wolf um, is an amazing company. He's raised some $200 million in their Series E round with a $1.3 billion with a B uh, valuation. Every year, businesses continue to make a significant new investments in cyber tools, yet we still see more and more breaches in the headlines, which is so true. Arctic Wolf's mission is to end cyber risk completely. Every organization should be so effective at security operations that both the likelihood and impact of cyber attacks is minimized to the point where risk is essentially reduced to zero. The Arctic Wolf platform and Kajir security team makes it fast and easy for organizations of any size to get world-class security operations that continually guard against attacks in an efficient and sustainable way. Their highly trained Kajir security experts provide 24 seven monitoring, detection and response, ongoing risk management, continually strengthening your security posture in this work from anywhere environment that we're in. They recently passed an incredible milestone of 97% customer retention, which is unbelievable. That's amazing. With a staggering 180% year over year growth in a number of their customers, uh, in number of customer acquisitions. So check out Arctic Wolf. It really is a new HMG top pick when they ring you up or Zoom into you, please reach out to them and set up a call. Find out more, learn more about Arctic Wolf. Uh, we love partnering with the Atlanta Sim Chapter and our other partners down uh, in the greater Atlanta area. So a big shout out to Atlanta Sim, uh, some 14 years strong. And Mark Taylor, the CEO of Sim International is here with us. Mark, great to see you. Hey, Hunter, great to see you as well. Thanks so much for your continued invest investment in all the communities and particularly in the Atlanta community. Uh, we've got a big show coming up uh, on the 15th, you know, uh, you and I doing the Sim Connect Live, our annual conference that we're partnering with to do virtual this year, and I'm looking forward to uh, working with you on that one. Sim Connect Live, uh, restaged, powered by HMG Strategy. Mark, we should have three to 500 people at that event uh, on the 15th. Yeah, I expect so. With the uh, response that we're seeing to our invitations, I think we'll be there and looking forward to having a, a great time with the entire community. Thanks, right, Mark. Looking forward to catch up soon. Thanks for being here. Yeah. So we have the HMG Marketplace. I think you heard a little bit about the opening. What are your specific organization's technology needs right now? If you could please uh, vote in the pop-up poll and hit submit, that would be fantastic. And I think we're going to run a video here. Later in today's program, HMG Strategy founder and CEO Hunter Muller will proudly recognize and honor global technology executives who matter. These top-tier CIOs, CISOs, and other technology executives have genuinely distinguished themselves in business transformation, digital disruption, innovation, and talent development through even the most difficult circumstances. These awards are not given lightly. They are earned. Recipients join an elite community of forward-thinking global technology executives in the HMG strategy community. We are delighted to celebrate these exemplary leaders and their teams who have delivered unparalleled value to their organizations, their communities, and our world. Please stay with us for the award ceremony and meet the 2020 Global Technology Executives Who Matter. Hey, real exciting times here, folks. Um, when you think about your top priorities today regarding the future of work, I think we have a little pop-up poll here, team. If you could please just uh, take a moment and uh, when the pop-up polls up, uh, vote and hit submit, that would be excellent. 
maybe we can uh, share the results here in uh, just a minute. But really appreciate everyone for uh, zooming in here today. You know, this is the most unprecedented time to be a tech leader. I've been studying and tracking our industry for over 30 years, three decades. And now it's not, it's never been a better time to be a tech leader leading and innovating in the C-suite, helping the board figure out the future vision and risk profile of the company, uh, facilitating and, and leading, uh, facilitating, enabling and leading uh, innovation with the line of business, again, with the C-suite, reimagining, reinventing the customer experience and the customer experience and reimagining and reinventing business models and go to market. There's not a better opportunity for you today to promote yourself in your current role, current team, current organization for success, as well as position yourself for future excellence and brilliance in terms of your next big deal, your next big gig, your next big opportunity. But it all starts with you here, here and now today. Take today as the next two hours to rethink and reimagine your whole go-to-market, your brand, your leadership style, your innovation style, how you look at new innovation technology, how you look at new technologies, and how you look at building a winning team, a winning culture, a winning organization that's powered up, powered up for excellence, powered up to win, and powered up really to drive a competitive advantage and demonstrative position in today's highly, highly competitive, disruptive markets. We've never seen a more highly competitive, disruptive, disruptive marketplace in our lifetime in our industry. So that's, I want to set the tone, the bar really high today with some high energy. First up, I want to introduce Dr. David Bray. David and I have been collaborating now going on 10 years. I've had the fortunate opportunity to know David for that long. And he's truly a genius, a world-class futurist thinker about the future impact on a global level of geoeconomic, geotechnical, geoenergy, georesource, and by the way, a bipartisan geopolitical point of view on what really matters for here for us here now here now today on a global level and what does it mean for you as an enterprise leader what do you need to know now that your ceo probably already knows the c-suite knows the business knows the the boardroom knows what do you need to know now to be prepared to pick up a water cooler conversation like that david right and dive right into what really matters on a global level so, hey, David, welcome to the program. I think we have a little bit of extra time this morning, so we can slow it down a little bit. But at the, at what you said you have some news, some breaking news from around the world, from the UK or Europe. What's, what's on your mind? Right. Uh, well, first, what's on my mind is really glad to be here, even if only virtually with Atlanta. Uh, my heart goes to Atlanta because I went to Emory University and then later signed up for the Centers for Disease Control, where I was actually part of what was called the Bioterrorism Preparedness Response Program back in 2000, when it was only 30 people. And it was actually scheduled weeks in advance for me to give a briefing uh, as to what we would do technology-wise should a bad day happen. That briefing just happened to be scheduled for September 11th, 2001, nine o'clock in the morning. And of course, as you know, the world changed. And now the world has changed again with COVID-19. So what's top of my mind is uh, we do know that there's going to be a new incoming administration to the United States. And uh, just this week, Europe has announced that they want to forge a data and tech alliance with the United States. Details still to be sorted out. Expect to hear more news in the next week or two. But the fact that Europe is reaching across the, the, the Atlantic, essentially, to engage the United States and think about how we can use technology and data um, to, to actually uplift our values. It's seen by a lot as a hedge against China and, and what China has done with Huawei and other companies such as that. It's going to be very interesting because it's going to put you and all the CIOs here in the driver's seat. And, and again, you may not be tracking the geopolitics of this, but if your company either does business with Europe, does business with people that are traveling from Europe, in the past, the last decade has been focusing on general data protection regulation, privacy, and there seemed to be actually increasing division between Europe and the United States. Now we're going to actually see very intentional efforts and maybe even possibly funding both from the U.S. side and the Europe side to do a data and tech alliance between the two continents. Hey, David, how real is this? I mean, I know that, in fact, when you think of uh, the regulators down in D.C. that they're, quote unquote, pseudo regulators relative to tech, I, th I think they kind of smile and they do a, the kind of a dance and and then uh, the tech guys get back in their private jets, go back to Silicon Valley. But I do know, in fact, that the EU and their watchdog, I, her name escapes me right now, but she is brutally tough oh, on yeah. US-based tech. So where does she play into this layer of net new news? Because when she levies a fine, it, there's a B in front of the fine. So it's billions. 
You're absolutely right. And that's exactly what we've been seeing over the last few years was, was B, you know, fines, uh, mainly focusing on Facebook and Google, but in, you know, basically any data and tech company, Salesforce actually got impacted as well that involved data and tech. And it was mainly going after, again, general data protection regulation. And you're absolutely right. Whereas, whereas the United States, you know, we, we, we sort of quasi-regulate. We really don't have that strong of an apparatus. Europe, you know, their diplomacy arm is tied very tightly with their regulatory arm. And the fact now that the US and Europe are now possibly talking about instead of being against each other, actually uniting, one, that's an opportunity, but we've got to figure out, you know, how are we going to have our data work with Europe's data and vice versa? And two, um, Europe, you know, they, they, they've just completed their elections before ours. It was about a year beforehand. They've got five years and they are talking about putting multiple billions of dollars in investing in new ways of doing tech because they see, again, and I would say where I'd be looking at as a CIO, Think about telco, thinking about 5G gear, thinking about uh, new ways of doing encryption or, or actually making sure your data is kept safe. These are all things that, again, are focusing on. We see what China is doing and how that's disrupting things. And I think Europe is coming to the United States very proactively. One, because Biden is probably the first president since Bush 41 who actually understands the value of NATO. And, and, and we, we've just been absent from the world stage in terms of US engaging NATO and Europe for the last 25 years. So this is gonna have interesting ramifications that boardrooms, CEOs are going to be saying, how are we playing into this? How are we actually maybe possibly tapping into the funding that either the United States is gonna make available for this or Europe? And again, these are early days, but this is gonna hit the ground running probably in the first 100 days of the Biden administration. Hey, David, anyone uh, come to mind or the group that comes to mind in terms of spearheading this uh, olive branch reach across the Atlantic? Uh, can uh, you drop a few names? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it really is. It, it's France, it's Germany, it's the UK. Um, you know, you and I were talking earlier. I mean, the UK already has actually formed a agreement on AI research with the United States. I think they're going to see others, France, Germany, and other ones wanting to get on that agreement as well. Um, so it's all countries involved and it really is... I mean, we at the Atlantic Council, we were initially kind of wondering, would this actually trickle down from the politicians in Europe saying they wanted to make this happen to the actual bureaucracy making it happen? But we're seeing all signs that probably in the next week or two, you're going to see even more strong overtures from Europe to the U.S. The question, though, is the U.S. historically, again, our diplomacy apparatus with the State Department isn't normally linked to the rest of government for a whole government response, such as from commerce or, or other parts like that. And I think that's where the Biden administration is going to have to receive this overture and say, OK, how are we going to link this diplomatic overture to what commerce is doing, to where we're maybe putting funding and actually incentives for tech companies to do this? But I do really see it as an interesting opportunity because, again, there's a lot of interesting places where the U.S. leads the way, but we've been held back by working in Europe, partly because they were concerned about specters of privacy or, or how their data was being protected. I think if we can reconcile this, it is a chance to grow and scale. And it really is an interesting opportunity for anyone who does business globally, particularly with Europeans or in the European marketplace to actually get a lead on this and actually to let your C-suite know. Because I actually would think CEOs will be talking about this in three to four months from now, but I don't think it's on their radar yet. Really? Oh, that's really fascinating. It's just so breaking news. I mean, this is really, it's, it's actually catching all of us by surprise because um, you know, again, we are so used to it being friction. And in fact, if you'd asked me a month ago, I would have said that we were seeing more of a possible cold friction between Europe and the United States when it came to data and technology, because they were concerned, again, about surveillance possibilities and privacy possibilities. But I think what they've seen, and they've seen the light is, you know, China's moving out there. And, and, and quite frankly, autocracies don't care so much about intellectual property. They don't care about privacy. And so this is a case where Europe's having to say, well, we don't want to have to be pick, picking and choosing between the United States and China. So if we're very proactive to an alliance and an engagement with the United States, that can actually be something that actually uplifts all boats. Um, also, what I'm excited about, though, too, is in the era of COVID-19, and we know we have to figure out the new future of work. I mean, we've jumped forward, quite frankly, five or six years ahead in terms of what pressures have been on the workplace to go fully digital, to go in terms of remote work and to work in a distributed fashion. The question, though, is we haven't seen organizations catch up with it. It's almost like our, our bodies have been thrown five or six years in the future, but our minds and souls are playing catch up. And so for CIOs, I'd be thinking about as we think about new ways of working, especially new ways of working distributedly, I can actually both engage with this overture that's coming from Europe and the fact that they do want to form a tech alliance, but also use this strategy for 
rethinking how my company does all its functions. I mean, it used to be in the days, and I know like the 90s and, and in the early 2000s, IT was seen as a support function. I would say if there's any company out there that doesn't recognize IT and digital is how you do every part of your business, then if you don't think that way, it's a recipe for, for, for extinction. You have to recognize IT and digital is how you do the business, even if your business is highly physical, highly interactive in nature, it's gotta be baked in from the start that you're thinking about digital and IT. Hey, David, step back uh, a little bit about the Atlantic Council and your mission, and, uh, and then I wanna go back to China. Sure. Um, so our mission at the Atlantic Council, we were created in 1961 when the Democrats from the Truman administration, sorry, the Eisen Truman administration and Republicans from the Eisenhower administration were so busy fighting amongst themselves that they forgot we're stronger together with allies, we're stronger together with sectors. The, the Geotech Center really is focusing on how data and technologies are changing geopolitics. And, and, and again, 2020 has been a wonderful, uh, I mean, I wouldn't have asked for it, but a wonderful series of examples of the debate about Huawei, the debate about WeChat, the debate about TikTok. Increasingly, technology issues are rising to the level of policy and actual geopolitical debates, and, and in some cases, actually even battles. And, and all signs are that's not going to ease up. If anything, it's going to get more and more intense in 2021, 2022. Uh, the Biden administration, as far as we can tell, while they may be more nuanced in their conversation with China, they're not going to take a soft line with China. If anything, they're actually going to continue to take a hard line. Uh, and you may have also seen there was a report that just came out this week as well from the Director of National Intelligence saying, and, and this was their words, the Director of National Intelligence saying, China's activities to include cyber espionage, to include information warfare, uh, what they call active measures, they say actually make it the biggest threat since World War II to the United States, which means- hey, David, didn't they just recently uh, kind of roll out their, their vision, 2020, 2030, 2025 vision? Oh, yes. I mean, there, there's definitely, I mean, you're seeing both the United States actually do its response, but you also see China putting forward its vision. And China's vision is essentially all things AI, they are a leader in, and they're using it to basically project power, to project influence. Uh, and so the United States is looking at that and saying, you know, again, autocracies have it easier. Uh, they don't ask for the public for consent. If you don't like what they're doing, you're either fired, imprisoned, or killed. Uh, they don't care about intellectual property either. Their private sector is their public sector. So, so they don't have to worry about interoperability or standards. And so here you've got China on one end, and then the other side, you've got United States and, and our partners in Europe, where we do care about what the public thinks. We do care about privacy. We do care about having a free market. It's not clear if our system um, will be able to move as fast as China. I, and clearly I am valuing our system, but I think that's gonna be something where CIOs, you're gonna increasingly be feeling um, possibly incentives from the US government, but also thinking about in a marketplace in which China's trying to fund its own companies, which are really fronts for the government, start to challenge you, you're gonna really have to figure out how do I operate in this environment in which data and tech is no longer just something that's about the boardroom and business, it's now come, become part of the geopolitical landscape and you've gotta be aware of these trends so you don't get caught in the crosshairs. I remember about five years ago when they decided AI, AI was important, they said, here's $2 billion, let's create a city around AI. Oh yeah, I mean, and that's again, autocracies, they just go and do it. Like, whereas we'll take time to debate, it'll take time for Congress to do it, and then you gotta appropriate the money. And, and by that time you're looking, you're watching, it's like three and a half, four years from now. And so it's not clear that what I would call our OODA loop, our orient, observe, decision, and act loop. And as you repeat that OODA loop, if the OODA loops for open societies like ours are as fast as more autocratic societies. And I think that's really gonna be the question of the next decade, which is why, again, CIOs might typically say, I don't get involved in geopolitics. Well, you may say that, but data and tech is increasingly going to get involved in what your organization and your company are doing. All right, so then who, where should CIOs go to get more information around this? Because you can't probably get this from Gartner or Forrester, the big four, McKinsey. <laughs> no. I mean, they're all in, kind of like selling their own FUD. Right. There needs to be an open platform with an open bi-directional dialogue around what really matters sifting through all this data. Yes, 100 percent. And I think, well, one, I mean, that's why I love what you do with HMG. I mean, it's, it's HMG brings together people. And I think it's recognizing we talk about all these issues in the context of how to do business better, how to do performance outcomes better for our organizations. And that's why geopolitics matters is it's, it, it will impact your bottom line if you're not tracking it. Um, I would also say SIM. I'm a, I'm a big fan of SIM and, and all the different chapters. That's another place. And then lastly, I mean, again, I'm biased, the Atlantic Council, but we are just one player. And I would say, if anything, 
what you may want to think about is creating an informal advisory network where you bring together people both at the local level, because I think you need to be listening to the local level as well. I mean, we're seeing unprecedented questions about how we need to reorient within the United States itself just domestically, uh, and questions about how can you be more participatory, involve the public in questions about their data, as opposed to just doing data to them. And so I think that's going to be important. But also think about, you know, maybe you can actually through HMG or through SIM, find people that can be your sounding boards, because these things are happening so fast, and they're going to continue to happen that fast. I mean, all signs are the first part of 2021 may actually be more turbulent than what we've experienced in 2020. And that's both nationally and globally. And so if we thought this was a busy year, uh, get ready for the next two quarters in 2021 to be even more busy. You know, the, the phrase that keeps coming to mind is don't let a crisis go to waste and this will be a time of innovation. What are the technologies that enterprise CIOs and CTOs and CISOs should, be, should have on the radar screen for the next three years? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, the Chinese, the, the, same, the same word for crisis also means opportunity in Chinese. So I think it's something to think about that with crisis comes opportunity. Technologies I'd be looking at that I'm seeing that are quite exciting as a fellow CIO. Uh, one is um, computer vision and automation and particularly the pairing of the two. Uh, I'm seeing companies do what I call AI process control. And what they're doing is they're taking the entire manufacturing process or the entire service process, and they're using computer vision to watch what either the machine does or what a human does or the combination thereof. They then, that's essentially teaching the machine what normal looks like. And then later when someone actually goes and actually does it, uh, the machine can actually watch and they can say, oh, well, you, 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 went, you went too far this way or that was out of kilter or it can actually alert you and say, I've been watching your manufacturing process and it's been behaving normally up until the last two hours and then something seems wrong. Maybe it's a hardware issue, a software issue, or maybe someone's actively trying to actually disrupt something. And the nice thing about pairing this with humans and machines is, as we all know, a lot of cases, some people are in lockdown. COVID-19 has actually forced us to actually work from home. You can do the same process and things that used to require centralized production can now be done decentrally but by combining computer vision with some parts of automation or even just monitoring of quality control, you can have the appearance of centralized quality control even though you're doing things distributedly. So I would watch that. Um, the other thing I would also say again, what COVID-19 does is propelled us forward five or six years ahead of where we would normally would have been. Additive manufacturing, as we all know, there's been a lot of interest in terms of using additive manufacturing for masks, for ventilators, that technology is actually leapfrog ahead as well. And so where in the past, you might've had to source your parts from halfway over the seas uh, and then wait for them to ship to you. Increasingly, I'm seeing companies actually print their parts that they need so that if something breaks down, you're not waiting for something to come from overseas, you're doing it locally. So those are the optimistic technologies. Uh, the other thing that I would also say that we need to be tracking is no longer is cybersecurity about making sure your hardware and software are secure. That's still very important. But I've been having conversations with CISOs um, nationally, and they're saying, a lot of them have been saying in the last two years, whereas their jobs used to be 90% cybersecurity, 10% dealing with misinformation, disinformation, now their jobs are 90% dealing with misinformation, disinformation, 10% with cybersecurity. And I would ask for CIOs and CISOs and, and anyone in the company, who is on first if your company experiences a misinformation attack? How do you respond to it? We know that if it's already out there and you're trying to play catch up, that can look defensive. It's hard to play and, and actually catch up if the space is already crowded. And lest that sound far-fetched, I have seen in the last year companies where entities intentionally shorted their stock, then they spread misinformation that was bad about the company, the stock dropped, they of course sold their short and made a profit, and so they made a profit off the misinformation. My question again is, is that marketing? Is that legal? I think the CIO is going to play a role, especially if it's being shared online and it's about your company. But I think you have to think about how are we going to respond as a company when a misinformation attack happens, because increasingly those things are happening. Hey, David, great to have you on the program. Always uh, enlightening uh, dialogue. Really appreciate our ongoing uh, rapport, collaboration, support. Uh, thanks for coming on the program. Oh, thank you, Hunter, as always. And thank you for all that you do and all the CIOs and CISOs do, because you are the future. Be bold, be brave, be benevolent. How Thanks. can people, how can people, thanks David, how, how can people learn more for, about the Atlantic Council and you? Yep, uh, all you have to do is go to GTC, that is gtc.atlanticcouncil.org, more details online. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Great, Thank, have a good weekend, Dave, see ya. Bye hey, bye. next up we have Pat Calhoun, Pat's the CEO of Espressive. We're gonna talk about the employee experience has become the digital experience. Hey, Pat, great to see ya. Yeah, it's great meeting you again, Hunter. W where are you coming in from? 
Uh, actually, right now I'm in Asia. Are you really? Yeah, I am. Yeah. So it's, uh, Fascinating. What time? What time of uh, the morning is it there? Two thirty in the morning. Wow! Wow! You're wide awake. God bless there you. There you go. That's yeah, great. Well, that's what coffee does to me. Hey, you know, Pat, you're an amazing uh, entrepreneur and a uh, founder of a, a really cool uh, AI company. When you think about um, the pandemic transforming the employee experience into a digital experience, what does that mean to you and your company uh, at Espressive? Well, you know, for Espressive, what we've actually seen is that the pandemic has really changed the way that people, people interact, the way people, the way people seek help. You know, a lot of the interactions in the office that used to happen by people walking up to each other, congregating in meetings, um, that's, that, that's kind of gone away. And through no fault of, of our own or of any company, we've actually had to go and replicate that whole physical experience in something that's truly virtual. And that has been, it's been a challenge for a lot of us, um, especially the people on the front line that actually have to use a lot of these technologies. And what we're actually seeing as well is while everybody's multitasking more than ever before, whether it's, you know, you're doing a Zoom, same time you got Slack messages coming in, email coming in, I got text messages, I got all this stuff coming from everywhere. It's actually a much higher level of cognitive load than we're actually used to. And we're all using these digital means to try to make all of this stuff work. And it doesn't mean that it's the same experience as we had in, in, in the physical world. It just means that it actually has to be replicated digitally. So I kind of view this as a transformation to a digital experience. It's just a brand new world. You know, when you think of that digital experience, it's been straining help desks and uh, uh, organizations alike. How do you help organizations at Expressive in that space? Well, yeah, it's really interesting. What we've, uh, we've done a fair amount of research and there's a lot of analysts have done uh, similar research. What we've found is that the overall help desk load has increased by 35% as a result of the pandemic, 35%. That's a huge number. Now, I believe that this is a result of two main factors. First and foremost, we're actually being forced or well, being asked to use apps that we've never had before. In some cases, it's people that have never actually worked from home. So there's new things like what's a VPN. But in other cases, it's also that as CIOs and organizations are embracing digital transformation, new applications, new capabilities are being sent to us. And so there's just a lot of new. And in some cases, it's about, it's about using applications much deeper than we ever have before. So that is introducing a lot of questions, a lot of issues and so on. The second one, and I think this is probably the biggest one, is that a lot of us, when we had questions before, we just shoulder tap our neighbor. Uh, I don't have a neighbor anymore. So, um, so you know, naturally what we do is we go back to what we've been doing for the past 15 years. We call, we send emails to the help desk. And that overall is what has really created that 35% increase in overall tickets. Sure. And, and so you have a test, for example, Pat, that highlights that? Yeah, well, quite a few. And in fact, I, you know, yesterday during your New York event, we had, I had Kumud Kalia, which I actually interviewed, right? And he talked about the fact that they've been deployed for a month now, and they're already seeing 40% reduction in overall call volume, which is phenomenal. But here's a really interesting uh, example I'm going to throw to you. So solar turbines is part of Caterpillar. Everybody knows Caterpillar. In March, when the stay home order came in in California and across multiple other states, what they saw is a 300% increase in overall IT touch points, 300%. At the same time, they were 40% down in staff. You know, they had some attrition, they didn't backfill because they were leveraging AI. And now they're seeing a 300% increase. Through AI and through automation, they were able to survive the month of March. Their barista, which is our virtual agent, actually handled 99 man days of work for them, 99 man agent days. So can you imagine like the amount of staff that they would have to hire to be able to handle that? So that's a huge, that's a huge testament of the value that we've actually been delivering to them. But here's, here's what we're now seeing. What that organization is, has actually done is every Friday, they decided that they're turning off the phones and they're sending everybody to AI. They've seen a huge increase in adoption, and it's been so successful that they're now turning off the phones on Mondays and during their shutdown weeks. So what they've been able to do with an IT is basically reduce their overall footprint and, and rely much more on automation. You know, Pat, it's clear that you love your company and you have a passion for this space. And what's the origin of that passion? I think a lot of that is uh, when I was at ServiceNow and I was reporting into the CIO, I basically ran products there. It was phenomenal. I got to interact with a lot of CIOs. And the message that I heard consistently from everybody 
was that ServiceNow at the time was helping them a lot in digitizing a lot of the back office processes. But when it came to the employee experience, it was like 1995. Everybody's still calling and emailing for help. There's no automation that's happening. At the same time, I don't know if you know this interesting statistic, Hunter, but the average attrition rate in the help desk is 41%. Really? 41, it's huge. So, you, so you're basically relying on a team that's constantly cycling in and out to deliver an awesome experience to the rest of the organization. How can you do that when 40% of the team is leaving? That's a lot of tribal knowledge that's leaving out the front door. And so I really came to the realize that the world is going to change. And you can't just build this through, through people. You have to start relying on technology. And so what does winning look like for a client when you're fully implemented at Espressive and, and, and what does it look like? We just had a customer go live, their financial customer on the East Coast, on the West Coast, excuse me. Um, they basically ran an NPS survey post go live, 93. You know, a lot of people think, boy, if I actually, if I, if I start leveraging automation and I ask people to go to virtual agent, is that going to hurt the IT's reputation, IT's image. Imagine if you could get 60, 60%, 70% automation, so re net reduction in tickets. You can start reallocating your staff to do things that have a lot more shareholder value than another password reset, and you get a 93 uh, NPS rating. I mean, it's, it's nothing but upside. Love it. Now, there are other folks that are out there that do this. What makes uh, Espressive so unique and it's so uh, really a category leader? I think part of it is the fact that our roots come in service management. We just, we understand IT, we understand service management, we understand that platform. Of course, we integrate with a lot more than service now, but we, we, that is our DNA. It's also the fact that we have built a platform that, that, that looks and behaves a lot like the way that Amazon has built their, their, uh, their Alexa or Google Home. Google has built their Google Home. The way that we learn, we are at a point now through our architecture where Barista, which is our virtual agent, understands over 1.3 billion different, thing, different, different things across 14 different enterprise departments, IT, HR, facilities, finance, legal, you name it. It's our architecture enables our customers to get live within six weeks, get immediate value. Most of our customers see somewhere in the 60 to 65% reduction after a month, two months of running live. The, most other most other tools out there are basically build your own tools and the level of effort and the level of talent and skill that you need to get it up and running is really, really high. So you work really well on a ServiceNow platform, right? Um, what are the yep. platforms you complement well? Uh, Ivanti, ShareWell, BMC, Jira, Zendesk, you know, we're pretty agnostic. So when it comes to ticketing systems, you know, systems of record, we integrate with most of them. And getting started, how easy is it to get started with you is it with a POC? Yeah, very easy. Just give me a call. I'll make it happen. How do people follow up with you, uh, Pat, directly? I'm on LinkedIn. Find me on LinkedIn. Shoot me a message. Uh, you can send me an email, patc at espressive.com, or just go to our website, espressive.com. There's a lot of resources there available for you. Now, you've been at this a while. You have deep funding. Where are you in your funding uh, process? So we closed a uh, really large um, fund round, funding round in, uh, in March of this year. We announced it in March. Uh, with, uh, it was actually led by Inside Partners. So we're now in our Series B. We actually have, uh, we've gone through three rounds of investments. We've raised Congratulations. So far. What okay. kind of a tech leader would you want us, HMD, to introduce you to? What is your ideal profile client or prospect that's ready to engage? We go after enterprise, right? We, you know, the, basically the G2K, 5,000 plus. For us, the way we look at this is that the larger the organization, the more complex it is for the employees. A small, you know, a mid, small to mid doesn't have that much value because everybody knows that they can call Joe in the help desk or they can call Mary in HR to get answers on finance or sorry, on benefits. You know, that's a fairly constrained problem, but we, we actually really solved it and we're sweet, our sweet spot is really the five to 15,000 and above. Excellent. Hey, Pat, great to see you. Thanks for coming in. Really, truly yeah, a global absolutely. event here coming in from Asia. What's it, what country? Uh, well, I'm in the country that we were just talking about a moment ago, and it's Got not because it. I do business with China. <laughs> I just happen to be here because my wife's from here, and we just had to come here for, uh, for, for a quick trip. Gotcha. Hey, take care. Be safe. And uh, looking awesome. forward to seeing you again uh, stateside. Cool. Thanks. All right, Thanks, bye. Pat. Hey, next up, we have Dr. Kenneth Russell. Uh, he's the CIO at Curin Biotech. 
we're going to, uh, Ken's going to lead the crisis and career preparing for the next opportunity. And all my friends are coming in from all over the world. Great to see you all. Great seeing you. Great seeing you. Uh, good afternoon, Atlanta. Uh, great to be back with you again. Uh, as Hunter said, this is the crisis and career preparing for the next opportunity uh, session. Uh, I'm Ken Russell. Uh, I'm the chief innovation officer for Curran Biotech, but I'm also a member of the Charlotte uh, SIM chapter where I'm also one of the founders of the chapter and a former president. So really happy to be involved with HMG and SIM International. Um, but as to kind of get us started and kicked off here a little bit, as COVID-19 has swept the globe, uh, CEOs and business executives uh, have discovered the true value of their technology leaders who have positioned their businesses to make a digital pivot. We've been using that word quite a bit and support a work from home environment. Now this type of foresight, along with the business savvy, many technology leaders have acquired positions technology executives well for future career opportunities. Now that's an interesting word, uh, savvy. It means understanding, of course, but it denotes so much more. Shrewdness, a practical knowledge, an ability to make good judgments, especially in disorienting times. And according to MIT's Peter Weil, organizations that are digitally savvy perform much, much better than their counterparts, relying on top technology talent focused on practices like rapid experiential learning, creating modular open agile systems, and maybe most importantly, transitioning from a command and control culture to coach and communicate environments. So today's panel discussion will help you discover, maybe rediscover your savvy. Uh, we'll hear insights and recommendations from search executives on how to position your career trajectory successfully and position yourself for that next big opportunity. So welcome, welcome to what I suspect will be a very informative and exciting discussion. We have a great panel for you and I'm gonna ask that they introduce themselves uh, take about a minute or two to do so. So we'll start with Renee Arrington. So Renee, welcome. Thank you, Ken. Nice to uh, to see you and nice to share the stage with, with my friends, Tony and Melissa and Steve and, and be here virtually in Atlanta with everybody. Uh, so my name is Renee Arrington. My firm is Pearson Partners International. I'm president and COO of that firm. We're based here in Dallas and I lead our technology and CIO practice. Great. Well, Steve, let's, let's bring you into it. Uh, tell us about yourself a little bit. Absolutely. Great to be here. Good to see you, Ken, as well as the rest of the panel. I'm Steve Kendrick, uh, president of KER Partners. I, too, I'm also based here in Dallas. Um, I'm president of KER Partners. We're a retained executive search firm, a boutique firm that specializes exclusively in recruiting CIOs, CTOs, the ever-evolving uh, interpretive CDO, as well as helping those leaders build out their executive leadership team. Glad to be here. Great, thanks, Steve. Melissa, tell us about yourself. Yes, hey everyone. I run Echelon Communicate and we are a coaching and communication consulting company. Our specialty is that sweet spot, that intersection of great leadership and powerful communication. And so we help business leaders, lots of tech folks to communicate with power and presence. We call it voice power, it's that authentic, genuine, honest kind of communication that we really need this year. Uh, Tony, uh, bring us home. Tell us about yourself. Um, I work for Diversified Search and like Renee and Steve, um, I'm a headhunter who focuses on the CIO and everything around the CIO, whether you call it a CTO, a CDO, a CDIO, whatever the title may be. That's, our, that's my focus. And uh, as we're going to cover in a second, what a wonderful time to be doing the kind of work we do. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, so folks in Atlanta, you can tell we've got a great uh, panel here for you to talk about that next big opportunity. So let's kick things off with Steve. Steve, let's talk about uh, this challenging year. No doubt, it's been a very challenging year, full of change and new demands. So what can you tell us about what's required of the tech leader looking for that next opportunity? Uh, how should we be equipped can we merely dust off that old resume, start clicking apply on LinkedIn, or is there something more? Yeah, I, I sort of described this year as the eight or nine month, I guess it's nine month blur at this point. It's been challenging, certainly for all of us. Um, if you are a CIO or CTO, or even a number two, a direct report reporting into one of those leaders today, I'm gonna give you a basically a three part recipe or approach 
uh, if you're legitimately interested in thinking about a change or being just open to a change. And the three-part approach is real simple and real straightforward. It's have a plan, be focused, and take action. Have a plan, be focused, take action. Let's talk about all three of those. Uh, having a plan is nothing more than making the decision to that you're open for a change and committing what's going to be necessary for you to fulfill that, to put yourself in play discreetly, albeit. And so think about, again, the time that it's going to be required to do that. It's going to require your commitment. In this same area, think about what, would, what are the drivers, spend some time thinking about what would be the drivers for you uh, to consider a change. Is it, is it to go to a different industry? It's not just going to another company per se, but going to another industry, maybe where you can apply your most recent experience and be, a, be an impactful leader. This might even uh, allow an opportunity for you to legitimately write these down. You know, what would cause me to legitimately uh, entertain being open to a change? Secondly, be focused. Don't approach this in any sort of scattershot approach, but think about it in the context again of are there other companies or industry segments that you can pursue that you can, of your aggregate experience to date in your career, is you can apply that experience and do two things. Number one, be impactful, given that experience that you, you currently have or may have, you may have gained over the last three or four years, but also bear in mind when you take that to another environment, into an environment where you can continue to professionally grow and develop. Uh, and then finally, take action. You know, where do you start? You know it's coming. And that is this notion of it's going to require you to take the time, everyone has to do it, sit down, refresh your resume. If you've been in your career 15, 20 years or more, it's not an exercise that really anyone enjoys, but it is necessary. It is essential for you to take the time and articulate again, how you've been the most impactful over maybe the last decade, 15 years. And by the way, if you've had that much experience, it's very easy that your resume will be uh, at least a three-pager. And even candidly, from our perspective, if it trickles over to four pages, that's okay too. So refreshing your resume, uh, lean on some people to take a look at it after you've gone through a draft or two of it. It could be some of us in the executive recruiting community. It could be some of your trusted partners in your network. And then that's, a, that's an easy segue into your network. What does your network look like? Is it too big? Is it too small? Does it have the you know, correct sort of quality level for you to achieve the, the next step in the direction of your career that you want it to take? Uh, and then finally, once you've got your resume in place, once you've sort of sorted out, you're, you're, you're looking at uh, your, your network, you know, who are those trusted advisors, mentors, ex-bosses, quite frankly, that you can discreetly reach out to and, and float the idea that, hey, I'm okay, I'm, I'm not unsatisfied where I am, but I, I'm starting to think about a change, the next step in my career. By the way, that might even be sideways to have the opportunity to grow and develop, again, in another industry with another company. So again, I can't emphasize enough, have a plan, be focused, take action. It's gonna be required in, in the move that you make, in this case, what might be the coming year. No, great advice. Uh, and in fact, I, I, what you guys will notice, folks, when, I, when I'm writing here, I do uh, what's called a mind map, where I just kind of capture the words that uh, our panelists are using. So I'm going to kind of repeat some of them back to you here. Um, you know, this idea of action, okay, uh, drivers. Uh, I like what he said, where he said, you know, refresh your resume, uh, impactful, um, lean on your network. And then that also got me thinking more from a physics perspective, this idea of impetus and develop, developing that momentum or what we call the flywheel effect, you know, get moving, make something happen. But that leads me to another question for, for you this time, Renee, you know, this idea, this sounds great, but if, if I'm an executive and I've been in that seat for 15 years, you know, what do I need to do to assess where I am in my career and what do I do? What are my next steps uh, to, to proceed all this? Sure, great, great question. I'll build on a lot of what, uh, what Steve has said, which I very much agree with. Uh, it's always important for us to, to push pause and take stock of where we are. But when you're thinking about, Ken, where you would like to go as an executive, couple of things. This year provides great content for you as a CIO because you've probably done some unexpected things <laughs> some new things, some different things, right? So as you're thinking about 
what should my next step be? Reflect back on what you've done this year that might have been new or different. And did you like it? If so, do you want to do more of it in a future position, right? So that's one way you can kind of assess yourself. Secondly, and this is pretty um, uh, uh, simple, but effective. Think about the, the, the role that you aspire to have, whatever that is, whatever that logical next step is for you, and what are your gaps? Okay, well, so to be a fill in the blank X, you need to have Y. I don't have Y, let me go get Y somehow, some way, in some position. You can also think about what you've done maybe three or four positions ago, and it was at a smaller scale, and you might have really loved it. And so you want to find a way to, to you know, reflect back on those capabilities, but do something with those at a bigger scale, right? So for example, I'm currently doing a huge search for a financial services client looking for a head of architecture. It is a big job. And you know, if one's not been in an architecture role in the last five years, but you did it earlier in your career at a smaller scale, that's an example of something you might want to reboot in yourself and do in a different environment or industry, as Steve said, or different setting, right? So that's another way you can kind of assess what you like. And then maybe the last way, challenge yourself with this question. Am I in my current role, in my current position on someone's succession plan? Am I on my CEO succession plan? Am I on the COO succession plan? Am I some way being looked at or groomed by my current company to succeed another C-level leader. And uh, that's another way, again, just, you know, grist for the intellectual mill to get yourself thinking about you and your career and where you are today and where you'd like to go. That's really fantastic, especially those, those last couple of things, this idea of, of having the, um, uh, where am I, if I'm there at all anymore? I mean, I think we make all make assumptions that we're part of the succession plan, but maybe, maybe after this year. Maybe not, but it's a good point. So this idea, the words that I wrote down, this idea of being able to, to take the time to push pause and really think about and reflect on your career. Uh, and again, I loved your line about great unexpected content this year, because again, as horrible as, as it's been, it's just really great that you've got this extra content. Um, the concept you said about doing a, a gap analysis, the ability to reboot. Uh, I love that. I love the, the, the imagery there. And then um, this idea of rediscovering your talents uh, from the past hidden or otherwise, you know, this idea, you can tap into your leadership traits. And, and this is where I've got to bring Tony in. So Tony, you know, I, I love your thought process on this idea of the, the changing leadership agenda, you know, this idea of openness, unlocking the human power and potential. What leadership traits uh, have emerged to you as being important? And how has that uh, changed in light of the, the COVID-19? So thank you again, Renee and Steve, great input. Uh, I appear with them often and I love everything they have to say. The leadership traits, I think I want to start with saying things have got really complex. Leaders now need to balance performance and delivery with a refined set of leadership skills. COVID has proved that top down doesn't work anymore. Leaders cannot be bottlenecks. Agility is increasingly important. So basically, you have to trust your teams and your teams teams need to trust you what does that mean it requires openness humility transparency vulnerability you've got to be really authentic as a leader there's a concept that's emerging called sort of psychological safety well what does that mean there are a lot of team studies which say that ingredient is most important for team success and and what is it 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 fosters innovation, you know, learning fast. I don't like fail fast, learning fast, taking calculated risks. Why? Because you know you're in this safe environment where taking a chance, taking a risk won't be immediately punished. That unlocks so much creativity and spontaneity and energy in your team. So you've got to balance this, let's call it slightly softer stuff with the hard stuff and that is an elevated leadership concept in my mind and and so this this idea of of delivery psychological safety and in this emerging society building a diverse team that addresses you know the, let's call it the the george floyd protests and the increasing requirement that's important and 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 
really additive to create this diverse team. Uh, all of those things, are, I believe, are incredibly important. And sort of to echo you know, what David Bray says, there's also this geopolitical environment that you've got to take in as well, which elevates the complexity once again. So what have you got to do? You've got to be bold, you've got to be brave, and you've got to be benevolent. I love the way David Bray put that at the end of his talk. Yeah, I love that alliteration too. Great stuff. And uh, Tony, I know you've got a hard stop at two o'clock, but I'll come back to you in a moment. But let's go ahead and uh, send it over to Melissa because I really like the way how this this um, uh, discussion so far has kind of kind of uh, called back to our introductory comments on this about this idea, Melissa, of of moving from command and control to coaching and communication. So, what's your perspective on how technology leaders can successfully make this transition? I think it's a really big transition for some people, and it's not as big a transition at, for others. So what happens with some is, is we go from command and control to control and control. So control and control is I want to control anything that I can find, and I want to lock things down to have them be as steady and stable as they can be. And that's not the season that we're in. The season that we're in is about agility, it's about flexibility, and it's about knowing that you, no one, has all the information that they need in the moment that you need it. So to go from command and control to a coaching kind of style and a, a communication style is to ask more questions. But it's hard in the beginning if you're used to giving statements. Putting a question mark at the end doesn't just change it from a statement to a question. You have to genuinely say, I will vulnerably ask, what do you know about this that I'm missing? What's in my blind spot? Who else should be in this conversation? So the first thing is to ask a lot of questions. The next thing is to think about the basics of teams. Something like 70% of organizations this year since March have undergone furloughs or layoffs. And the trickle down of that is that somebody who was a pivotal person on your team isn't there anymore. Somebody has joined your team that you don't know. Somebody's merged a group together. And so all the team dynamics are all over the place. And realize that you've got to bring empathy online. So that's putting yourself in the other guy's shoes and truly saying, as a business leader, I am heavily interested in my results in delivering. I really want to deliver. But if I stay outside the team and think that the more clear I make my requests, the closer we'll get to the right solution, I think it's not the season for that. It's the season to roll up your sleeves and say, okay, the team dynamic is off. What do we do about the team dynamic? Something like 52% of CEOs say they're spending time once a month dealing with significant interpersonal problems with their direct reports. So that's a lot of energy and time going into all the people dynamics. So we've got empathy, we've got teams, we've got those basics. I'll say one more thing, messaging, messaging. We all know what's important when we hear it over and over. When it's tossed out once and then the message changes, it's a flash in the pan. So I think technology leaders are so good at thinking through process and a message is a process. It is, it's saying, what do my people need now to keep our eyes on the price? Is it let's launch, learn, relaunch? Is it embrace failure? Let's just do it fast. Is it ask a question, don't give an answer, ask a question. Whatever those themes are that will really connect with the people who matter most in your world, those are the right messages. And to bring it to life, tell a story, reveal yourself, share your vulnerability. How have you gotten through a difficult time? I think the best way to ask a lot of people, and we're in a time where we, we have no map, the best way to do it is to share your own circumstance of not being the only one with the answer. Invite others in. That's great. You know what? I told you guys, I promised you guys before that our time would go by very quickly. And in fact, we have probably less than 10 minutes now, but I want to go back to you, Renee, because you know, from my mind map for Melissa here, uh, I, I, I talked about, I, I wrote down uh, you know, genuine, vulnerable, she said, 
this idea of clarity, empathy, um, the, the ability to ask. And I guess that also infers to listen and not be a bully and try to answer the question that you're asking <laughs> yourself. So, so Renee, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to get to is that what, what kind of criteria do you use as a search executive when you're evaluating whether someone is fit for a role um, that will be a step up maybe in responsibility? Good question, good question. And I think um, the most important thing in any situation when you're serving a client is to know your client's culture, particularly when it's a step up role, right? Because a candidate, an individual may not check every box in terms of the qualifications if they're gonna be stepping into that position, but if they're a good cultural fit within that organization, that company, your client, will be much more willing to give that step up candidate the runway that they need or the honeymoon they need, pick your word, to, um, to fall in line with that position and grow into that role, right? So what does that mean? And, and can it's always relative? Uh, every client has a different culture, right? So in some cultures, politics is the name of the game and they eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In other cultures, that's not a big deal. Uh, so you can use formal assessment instruments mm -hmm. like, um, you know, Gallup Strengths Finders, like Hogan, like Myers Briggs, like Berkman, to do those kinds of matches. Or and, and I do some of that, but honestly, at this point in my career, a lot of it's intuitive, right? You you get a sense from the way someone comports themselves, from how they speak, from what they emphasize when right. they're telling you their career story. Does that match or not match with our client? That, that's perfect. I think that's what I'm going to try to get us to kind of close in on as we finish up our session, this idea of being intuitive. Now, Steve, I have a question for you, but in, in light of the fact that I know that Tony has to leave here in, in mere seconds, I'm going to let you go first, Tony, and, and try to help wrap this portion up. Uh, we talked about in, being intuitive, as Renee says, but you also talk about, you know, what are, you, you have an intuition as well about themes that um, have emerged for your clients. Can you tell us a bit about what your intuition says about what's going on? Um, are you talking about, yeah, my clients are just figuring out that data and, and IT is what is saving their companies. I think if I was to, you know, that's, that's what everyone's figured out. The question that Renee was addressing is, how do you know if people are ready, ready for promotion? Absolutely, and, yeah. And, and, and my view is, is that you can kind of figure it out. People are made up of their values, their personality, their intellectual, let's call it IQ or cognitive strength, their knowledge and skill and their maturity. And a lot of this is around how smart are they? What is their ability to solve unique problems, which is like the cognitive capability, but with a, with a level of maturity. And that's from where this vulnerability and openness springs. Because to solve these problems that are out there that you've never seen before, you need to ask questions. You need to change direction. You need to be completely open. And if human beings and leaders don't have a level of maturity that, are, that they're comfortable being humble, and they're comfortable being open, you're gonna end up with a disaster. And our job is to try and triangulate all of those things into a package and assess the individual at a deep level. Well, that's perfect. And, and thank you, Tony, for joining us today. Um, so if we lose you, we'll have to say goodbye to you. But, uh, but Steve, let's go ahead and, and kind of shift this over to you a little bit because you had this really great point about your network, right? And uh, you know, leaning on your network, um, Kind of talking to your network. Now, I know that a lot of executives kind of have this, uh, well, we'll call it ego. <laughs> and they don't want to admit, just as what Renee and, and Tony were saying, or, or being what, what Melissa just said, being vulnerable. So what can you share with us about, you know, leaning on your network? What, what can you tell us about that? Well, the, the reality is that any network is going to include a lot of different characters, right? There are going to be some people that you can have a drink with, at 10 o'clock at night after a program that you've attended. And there may be people that you just know on more of a cursory level. So the reality is that, look, the situation is the same irrespective of if you're the CIO of a financial institution that's very small in Colorado, uh, just like a CIO that's uh, maybe a CIO or CTO for a large bank in Chicago. The, the reality of the situation is that the dynamics the demands, the realities of the murkiness, the nuances of what's going on in the world today, those are all the same. But it really comes, it really is only developed over time. I was, I was having a conversation earlier this year with uh, someone I've known for many, many years, 
And I was asking this uh, very well-known uh, CIO, you know, where do you get the greatest sort of mind share swap from your network? Is it, is it this program? Is it this form, et cetera? And his comment back to me was, he said, you know, Steve, at the end of the day, it's the people that I've known the longest that I can approach on a one-to-one -one basis. So my, my point in all this is that, you know, your network, and this, I referenced this when I was talking a moment ago around, around this whole notion of, you know, what does your network look like? You know, can you refine it? Are, are there people that, you know, that you can lean on in a very discreet way for guidance, input, reaction to something that you're thinking? And that, you know, quite frankly, that might lead to introductions to people like us in the executive recruiting community. It might lead to other uh, relationships that these leaders have with some of their peers, maybe people in the private equity or venture world. But it takes time to develop those relationships, quite frankly, just like it takes time to develop relationships with us. Oh, absolutely. Now, I know Hunter just popped in here, but I'll, do, I'll give Melissa the final word here on you know, what's your intuition saying as well, Melissa, and then we'll head it back over to Hunter. Well, my, my final word is the word grace. I think we all need to extend grace. And people have been so gracious. I was at a Zoom meeting and someone's child came in in their diaper with no shirt on. And I just thought, I hope the boss doesn't get mad. And he didn't. He smiled. We went on with the meeting. And I think that's the crazy season that we're in right now. Just right. need to extend grace. Yeah, I love that. And thank you. And thank you, panel. Uh, what a great conversation. Hunter, thank you for the opportunity. Ken, always great to see you. Great job. Uh, Renee, great to see you. Melissa, nice to meet you. Steve, great to see you, my friend. Take care, Super. folks. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. Much. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next up, we have Shokat Ali Bahamani, uh, CIO and CDO and Vice President Schaffler Group, leading a panel on reimagining the business and the future of work. Shokat, take it away. Thank you so much, Hunter. And we also request our other panelists to join us at this time. Perfect, perfect. We have all of them. So again, good afternoon, Atlanta. Thank you so much for joining. I think we'll be talking over the next uh, 30 minutes or so about reimagining the business and the future of, of this new work environment. I think we all have experienced over the last few months, um, a lot of things change for CIOs and, and, and the IT organization. Now, some of these changes are temporary. Uh, those are pandemic specific, and hopefully they will go away. However, we all have experienced that there are changes that they're gonna stay with us forever now, okay? So we will be focusing uh, today on those changes that's gonna stay with us and see how we are dealing with those changes. So to start with that, I'm Shaukat Ali Bamani uh, from Scheffler Group, about $4 billion manufacturing company of automotive and industrial products. And I would like to have my other panelists to introduce themselves, you know, their name and, and, and their, their position and what industry and company they belong to. Starting with Jay, welcome. Yo, Kat, good to see you, my friend. How are you? I'm fine. How are you doing, Jay? I'm good, buddy. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, I am Jay Farrow. Uh, as of last week, the former CIO uh, for the Quick Creek Companies and uh, soon to be the CIO of a company to be named in the not too distant future, uh, which I'll share as soon as I can. But um, I was able to find my successor uh, at the Quick Creek Companies and, and hand off to, to him. And uh, after a, a terrific run what, that I'm very thankful for, but um, you know, onward and upward, as they say. Perfect, uh, uh, Rafael. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Shukat. It's good to be here with Jay and Craig. And I want to thank also Hunter and the sponsors because this is a great forum. I am the uh, Chief Information Officer for Fell Entertainment, and we are the largest producer and uh, uh, of touring and of live entertainment. Uh, and happy to be here to discuss uh, these topics. Okay, and Craig. Hey guys, and greetings to Atlanta and uh, to my fellow panelists. I'm Craig Macrath. I'm the Senior Vice President responsible for global support here at Romini Streets, and uh, we provide a replacement for the support services from uh, Oracle, SAP, uh, Microsoft, IBM, and uh, yeah. other companies. And yeah. uh, my responsibilities are to drive that uh, the global team that delivers the support uh, day to day uh, for our customers. So uh, great to uh, be on the panel and get a chance to uh, connect with everyone today. And a quick plug, I am a three-time customer of Romania Street, so I'm just going to throw that right in. Thanks, Jay. It's yeah. great to have you. 
Okay. So we'll proceed, but before that, Rafael, just one comment, if you could somehow get a little closer to the microphone so we could have the, uh, uh, the good audience could have the good experience. Okay. Moving forward, um, so I think we talked about those changes, the permanent changes. So the first thing, if you could share with you what has changed in your business or with your customer engagement, what has changed permanently? Uh, Rafael, want to take this one? Well, I mean, it, it's a little difficult to realize how many of the changes will become permanent. Uh, but as you can imagine in our business, we look at cities. I mean, we, we tour our events from cities to cities. So we follow a lot of the challenges that the MLB, that the NFL and any of the other leagues uh, have. And we're basically keeping a very, very close uh, ear as to what some of those changes. Right now we're dealing with physical distance changes. We're dealing with contactless changes in terms of the merchandise sales. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at as the upcoming vaccine will come out, we've already seen a lot of movement in the industry talking about how do you validate with some of the platforms that are used today in airports, how do you validate that the guests that come to our events have actually taken the vaccine or have had actually negative results? So we, we still don't know. We know for sure that the contact place, for example, that improves the experience of the consumer, those changes will come and stay. Because uh, as you see in supermarkets, delivery, uh, once you get the convenience of some of these things that you don't have to wait in line, they're gonna stay. Uh, some of the others are gonna depend on how the uh, cities, the jurisdictions, and, uh, and some of the other agencies that control, uh, you know, how many people we can put in our events, uh, wh where do they end up? Okay, great. Okay, Jay, what about you? What, what do you see? Again, you are in transition, but I think you have a lot of experience hmm. in, in different um, uh, organization and industries. So what, what do you see changing permanently? Well, I think, you know, I think options will remain permanent, right? I mean, I, I think there'll be a back. What I mean by that is that, look, I think there's going to be a backlash once once we all feel safe and once the 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 Oh, pandemic is old over. I think there's going to be a hunger for that human interaction and to all come together, go to a sporting event, go to a restaurant, get together as family, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the, the reality is some of it, in, in whether it's the, to, you know, to Raphael's point, the convenience of ordering online, the convenience of curbside pickup, those types of things, I, I think will continue to, can continue to stay. I think we've proven out distance learning works, but can work very, very well. Although if you were my son, they, they think it stinks because they, they enjoy human interaction uh, and they like actually going to class. But, you know, for me, I, I think options will stay. I mean, and I think companies will know that they can do both. Companies will continue to make both options, I think, available based on, you know, what their customers want. Uh, so I, I, I think that that is here to, you know, those, those are here to stay. I think the notion that everybody is going to be working from home and nobody's going to want to go to the grocery store ever again. And that, that is ridiculous. Uh, we're social creatures. I guarantee you this fall, assuming that the pandemic is quote, again, has subsided, you're going to see 95,000 people in a sports stadium having a good time. I, I promise you that is going to be the case. Good. Hopefully you're right. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Craig, what about in your business? What, what do you see that? Yeah, look, I think the great comments from the other panelists, I think remote work is a huge thing. And I think that you know, we, we've been running a business for many, many years, which is dependent on remote workers. So I've got teams in 17 different countries and we're largely remote. We were 80% remote before the COVID hit. But now what we're seeing is just an acceptance in business to do business remotely. And whether that's sales meetings, whether that's support work, whether that's just catch up, you know, there's a lot more accepting and it's accepting of occasionally there's going to be a kid in the background. Occasionally there's going to be a dog barking. Occasionally these are the things that were, you know, it, it used to be, well, you know, we're, we're having this, you know, this meeting, we must meet in person. We must shake hands with everybody. I think some of those things can perhaps start to decline. And I think, you know, we can make more sensible decisions uh, you know, I, I was one of sure, many in the audience constantly down at the airport flying from spot to spot. And we've, we've learned that's not necessary in so many instances. So I think that will be a, a trend. I think, you know, flying perhaps more for leisure and, and for, for certain important occasions, but I, I could see that going down. Not great for our airline clients, of course, but, uh, you know, I think it is going to be a, an interesting change in, in the total dynamic 
uh, and a, a huge boost for organizations that are, are able to embrace that and are able to embrace that remote working. If, if you can have that in your culture, if you can trust your team mm. to work remotely, uh, then you, you're in a very good position. I will add on to that. And I will say that, look, if you're a CIO or a senior executive looking to, to, to hire talent, I mean, you've now knocked down borders, right? If you're working effectively as a remote team, and if I were limiting myself to finding people in Atlanta uh, for my team, I can now find people anywhere, right? Because I know people can now work anywhere and it, we've proven it works. Mm -hmm. And even for your more older school companies, they're like, well, wait a minute, th this actually wasn't all that bad. So I can now look for talent in markets that I never looked for before because I know I, I'm capable of managing remote teams. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, I think, a huge benefit. I think Craig's spot on. I think, well, it'll cause us to really evaluate whether or not I need to hop on a plane just for a, a dinner or for a meet and greet or something like that, yeah. So, so what about in, in the core business, like in, in your sales, in, in sales channels, in supply chain, in your um, uh, production, manufacturing, whatever business you are in, have you seen any permanent change in those core business segments? Well, it's real hard to make product when you're not at the factory, right? So, I mean, I, I, I feel like, you know, when you're, when you're building, you know, putting concrete in bags or making building materials or putting, you know, all of those th types of things, I can't do that virtually. Yeah. So it was up to us to create safe environments for our employees and make sure that we really manage their health and our customer's health first and foremost. Okay. Uh, but there are some things that just can't be virtualized. Um, so that was really tough in the manufacturing space. So, so, so then, then let's put ourselves back in our CIO roles. So as a CIO, um, what, what one best thing you have done uh, so far to support one of those permanent changes? If anyone wants to take a lead on this. I'll, I'll, I'll take that, Shukat. Um, you know, from our perspective, um, you know, first of all, you know, enabling the, uh, the mobile workforce it's, it's very big. Um, our production starts when we recruit performers in our theatrical. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that everybody comes to one location. So, you know, we've improving how we do that. Uh, also, in how do, we, how do we manage our merchandise sales? Right now, in some of our shows, uh, you can actually buy the merchandise ahead of time while you're sitting at home the day before, and you come mm -hmm. to our shows and you go to a designated place and you get the merchandise that you order. So all those things we managed to do rather quickly with, uh, with good partners. I think that's a good example. So I think also in our automotive um, aftermarket sector, we did an excellent uh, exhibition, um, uh, which we normally do in person or, or this time it was all done remotely. And there was a great success, you know, a lot of interest from our customers. And, and so, 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 so now we could even go into more of these as compared to before where you had to have the logistics and time and the cost involved versus they, these are more effective and, and much more timely. Good point, you know? And if I, can add, if I can add one more thing, we see a direct impact of marketing when the tools are such that people actually are buying before the event, mm -hmm. a simple message to the people that have already registered into our events, within hours, we see the actual sales coming up. So it's kind of like an immediate uh, perception of how successful your programs are. Okay. So, Craig or, or I, Jay, any comments? I'd just add to that. So we, we provide support to a lot of essential service providers, whether it's hospitals, uh, manufacturers of PPE equipment and, and other things. And you know what, what we've seen is people changing to be able to keep doing business during this time. It's extremely difficult, you know, it's under very, you know, high pressure. Um, a lot of the health providers that we're, we've been working with have seen a big transformation to telemedicine. And part of that is that cultural change. I think, you know, Jay touched on it before. There are some, some things you just can't do remotely even the things you do remotely, people are doing differently. So, you know, there was a, I was having a conversation the other day with a healthcare provider who was talking about the percentage of telemedicine and how much that's increased and training doctors to use uh, technical equipment in a way that they haven't been doing that before. And mm -hmm. IT is doing that. IT is absolutely right there in the front lines, making that happen. And where IT might've been a little bit behind the scenes, working on things that maybe weren't making the headlines. Now it's enabling that business to continue. And in some instances, really to, you know, to, to surge. 
Mm. Jay, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I think all that's spot on. I, I think IT now has been thrust into the spotlight and, and I hope for good reason. I'm sure we've all heard cases where it was for bad reason during all of this because IT failed to respond mm -hmm. um, and wasn't prepared. Not that we all thought a pandemic was coming, but wasn't able to pivot very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, I think most companies have pivoted, pivoted well. So IT is now in the spotlight. It's up to the CIO or IT leaders to keep it and, and, and stay there and, and not make everything about IT. That's not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But to be seen as a proactive business leader that really is a, is a business leader first in a, in a technology a second. Mm -hmm. And to Craig's point, we were an essential service. So for us, when you're sending all these people home, whether they're sales, regional mm -hmm. managers, all these folks who normally were in a corporate office, mm -hmm and giving them visibility into real-time analytics, giving them visibility into collaborative tools and everything that they can do their job where they don't have to physically get out and go to a plant or go see a customer. And we just pivoted like that. You know, it, it was huge. And it's like, you're talking about an 80 year old family run company. It wasn't, it's not like mm. they were used to this type of thing where everybody's at home. And, and I think everybody looked around after a few weeks and was like, wait a minute, this is actually not that, we don't want to be in a pandemic, but this is working pretty well. I mean, we, we know we can do it, um, which, which has been great. So, you know, it's obviously a testament to the IT team, but um, yeah, I, I feel like IT, look, if you, if the spotlight is now on you and to Craig's point and Raphael's point, they're looking at you like, well, wait a minute, I didn't know you guys could do this, but continue to, to drive to bring those solutions forward and, and, and stay there. So, so while we continue our discussion, I may ask Nikki if they could put one of our poll questions out there. So, so next is that, that, that any one of you could share one success or example that, that, that you or your team have done to, to support one of those uh, 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 prominent changes? You know, if you implemented any solution, infrastructure, organizational change, any, any success story you want to share? I'll take that, Shukat. I mean, I think the first comment is, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. And as you come into the situation of a pandemic, for example, uh, implementing teams, I mean, we did it in about seven or eight days. And as you typically know, every project of this magnitude that impacts thousands of, of, uh, of costs of employees, mm. it takes time, okay? So number one is the speed to market. We are able to, because we have the need. The other aspect is also uh, you know, the implementation of the contactless. Uh, as, as I've been involved with a number of uh, retail implementations. And again, because we are in a situation where we are, the resistance to change or the willingness to come in and immediately work aggressively to make an implementation, realizing that it will not be perfect, but that we will work together and making sure that the tool satisfies the needs and the ROI I think it's been for us un unprecedented. That, that's good, that, that's good. And in our example, so we had implemented Microsoft Teams a year or two years ago and people were still using Skype. So mm -hmm. in January of this year, we had about only 2000 meetings were established through Microsoft Teams in January. And in October, 45,000 meetings were established in Teams. So the people realized the Teams as a collaborative platform. Uh, and I think again, in your example, yeah. Uh, so, so I think again, the next question may help us, you know, uh, to, to maybe answer this question. Uh, did the pandemic help you expedite your journey? Jay, what about you in your example? Fired like a rocket. Yeah, we were already moving at light speed, but yeah, all this did was pour gasoline on it, Shokat. I mean, it really, you know, it, it showed where we had done really well and where we had made really good investments and decisions, but it also showed some opportunities where um, where we had maybe deep, not deprioritized, but yeah. you know, put things second, third, where we really needed to, to kind of ratchet those up, yeah. primarily around paper-based processes and, the, and, and multiple handoffs and not leveraging RPA and a few of the other things. And it wasn't super critical in that, like it broke everything, but it really just said, now look, we have a huge opportunity and everybody, the light went on for the business and kind of saw, okay, if we do make some of these investments, these pain points and these friction points mm -hmm. go away. So yeah, it absolutely poured gasoline on it for us. Yeah, so, so can any, do you have any example where, where for example, if your organization have now uh, used more um, AI or RPAs or, 
or 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 other maybe um, uh, other other those digital solutions to to maybe right. digitize your your other operations. Yeah, absolutely. For us, it was IoT. You know, it was it was putting in sensors in our plants. Now, if you imagine you have hundreds of plants across North and South America, and you're making all of these you know different products with all these different business lines. Mm -hmm. You have equipment that has built-in sensors that can tell you, you know, that, that can give you vibration information and, and all of these. But we weren't on a holistic way looking at all of that, pulling it into a central area, learning from all of our different plants. Mm -hmm. And we were bound, still bound by manual processes around temperature, vibration, um, uh, all types of all types of sounds and everything. And so we partnered with an IoT company as a proof of concept and said. And we took maybe the top five to 10 manual processes where it was, hey, Shokat's going to go out three times a day into this warehouse, look at a thermometer, a physical thermometer, write it down on a, on a, yeah. on a pad, come back, enter it into a system and have nobody look at it. Yeah. And I'm like, that is, I can put a hundred dollar industrial strength sensor in there and collect that information every second in real time and yeah. give a dashboard and buy the, and, whether it's noise on an equipment and knowing it's going to fail before it actually fails, it's vibration detection, so I can I can understand that I need to take a piece of equipment offline before it actually dies, so that I don't ruin production and we end up with an, an unexplained or un, you know uh, an, an an outage that we we didn't know was coming. Huge huge dollar capabilities, and uh, so for us it just we looked at that and said there is no way that we shouldn't be making these investments. I, so, I can so share. I so question for Craig. So we saw the, the survey, 86% 80, of our audience said that yes, this pandem unfortunate pandemic situation has helped us to expedite digitalization. But to my surprise, the other 14% did not. Do you have any suggestion for those how they can take advantage of, of this situation to, 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 to move forward in this direction? Well, you know, I think alignment of IT spend to, to the business has always been important. And I think the mm -hmm. most successful IT teams have always known that. And you, you get mm -hmm. the most accomplished from your IT strategy when the spend mm -hmm. helps improve the bottom line, increase the clients, improve retention, profitability. Mm -hmm. But now it's, you, you may have thought that you were going to spend that budget on something like a new features or some other change. But now when you've got a situation where there are layoffs, where Mm -hmm. customers aren't paying their bills or customers are disappearing completely a customer that you thought you could always rely upon they're out of business your offices are empty uh, you know employees that, that remain with you are now 100 percent remote so your priorities have to change the good mm -hmm. news though is that it absolutely can be part of that solution so whether it's security iot is a great one enabling 5g uh you know these are things that can deliver that return to the bottom line and you can do so actually with surprisingly low cost. You need to end the unnecessary projects and focus on those projects that really make a big difference, a notable a difference to the business. I think that IoT example is a great one. I think a lot of people have got some 5G initiatives that they want to get their hands around uh, now. For us, it was AI, and you know, as you as you deploy that 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 money to where it counts, um, that's when it, it really makes a big difference. I think that's a good suggestion, correct? That's good. So we'll go to our third question, uh, uh, polling question. But but let me let me ask Raphael this. So so we are also um, uh, let me get this out of my screen. So uh, Raphael, we are also talking about um, uh, uh, partners in this situation. So so with this change, we can't do it by ourselves. So we have to rely on our partners. Have you seen any? change in the way you have to now work with your partners or how could you take advantage of their skills and abilities to move forward with this? Absolutely. I mean, I think we've seen a significant increase in cooperation, mm -hmm. uh, not only with partners that can provide or bring solutions to you, but in some cases, even competing entertainment uh, models. Uh, mm -hmm. Our business, for example, we're very close to the venues or we're very close to the leagues and the amount of sharing and cooperation that has taken place because we're all dealing with the same issue. And if mm -hmm. one part of our business is successful, take sports, mm -hmm. we're all going to be successful. We're playing on the same stadium. So, you know, there's a lot of cooperation there. And it's a lot of cooperation on people that are bringing solutions to the market. We've seen agility. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen speed to market increase. And mm -hmm. we've also seen the acceptance of the consumer. That's mm -hmm. the other thing that, you know, from an IT perspective, we look at two dimensions, right? The systems that we build for our people, our employees, 
but also the systems that we use to interact with our consumer. Our consumers increase of using analytic or digital uh, products has, has increased during this time as well. So we've seen all of that have been very positive, at least for our industry. Okay, so I think we talked about all these permanent changes that our business is seeing and how as CIOs, we could support those permanent changes with new technology, new partners, um, and, and all those um, um, uh, uh, examples in there. So, 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 so one maybe concluding feedback or suggestion as you saw on the feedback that most of the companies are saying that you know they have the, 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 the same budget available. Some may have less, some may have more depending on the industry you belong to. Um, so what, what, what maybe as a conclusion, what's one, one suggestion you may have for, for our participants that they could uh, do to take advantage of this, this um, uh, situation and then help their organization to move forward or support one of those permanent changes. Jay? Well, don't take your eye off the ball, right? Keep, keep your foot on the gas and, and make sure that you, you know, don't let the good crisis go to waste. I, I think this, this crisis has revealed leaders of various types, has revealed who on your team is, is uh, you know, got a high potential, what ideas are working, what ideas aren't. Uh, if you have the same budget, look for opportunities to cut costs in other areas. I know we self-funded a lot of the work that we did with the rollout of SD WAN to all of our plants and being able to sunset some legacy MPLS technologies and all of these other things. Huge win. I mean, huge win. Those dollars were recouped and we were able to repurpose those for some of the more innovative things. Uh, so continue to look for those opportunities, but do not rest. I mean, CIOs today or IT leaders, whoever you are, um, the pandemic is going to go away, but continue to keep your sense of urgency and your bias for action uh, and and don't let up. That, that's good, good, good advice, Craig. Yeah, Your look, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll follow on that thought. I think it's return on investment. Okay. Jay said, don't take your eye off the ball. I, I said, don't take your eye off the return. So if you look at the projects that if you look at the projects that you're running today, yeah. which ones are going to return something to you in the same calendar year in which that project was approved? If it's not going to return something, cancel it, move on to something else. And once you've done that and been brutal about it, you can then have those that are going to get you that return. And as you heard in that great example, you can reinvest that where you need to then. So, you know, where is that return? And I'd also say make the project team accountable for that return. Too often times yeah. this, yeah. this happens. People will pitch an idea. It's happened yeah. to me all the time. People come and pitch an idea. Oh, this is going to return all these fantastic things. Okay, you need to stand behind that, right? You're yeah. accountable for that return. If you make that happen, you get the return and then you can spend it where you need the money to go. Okay. Rafael, final thought? Yes. Yeah, so I, think, I think there is also a change in mentality when we talk about agility, sense of urgency, we also need to talk about flexibility and not only ourselves, but also with our, with our vendors. Mm -hmm. You know, when we negotiate contracts before the pandemic, we always negotiate levels going up. So if I have a mm thousand -hmm. seats, okay, how do we get to 2000? Mm -hmm. And I think it's not a bad thing to say, well, how do I get back to 500? Not because there's gonna be another pandemic, but what if we become so productive mm -hmm. that instead of needing 500 licenses of this, I need only 200. So I think all that level of agility works both ways mm -hmm. because the better I get, the better relationship. And I finish with the last point that I think uh, in the previous panel, grace. Grace in the relationship with our, with our partners. Mm -hmm. And because this time is when they come to work with you and they really sit down and, and, and you know, we handshake and that's what a true partner is all about. So that's what gets you to long-term partnerships. Thank you so much. Now, I think it was such a wonderful uh, discussion. Again, I hope our participants also got a lot out of it. So thank you so much, Jay, Craig, and Raphael. Wonderful discussion. Hope to see you again soon. Thank Great. you, Hunter, for okay. giving us the opportunity. Shokat, you always nail it. You always deliver. One of our top facilitators in the world, leader, thought leader, Shokat. Great job. And Raphael, thank you. Craig, and Jay, always good to see you. I feel like I'm around on a Friday afternoon great, brilliant thought leaders, industry thought leaders and friends. And, you know, shout out to you, Craig, and your whole go to market uh, at Rimney Street. Uh, and literally the customer sat levels that you deliver are outstanding across the board, 4.9 out of five, right? 
we're very proud of that, mate. It's it's a huge accomplishment. I can't say we'll always sustain it, but uh, yeah, we're, we're very, very pleased to be there. It's incredible. I, I, will, I will give them a, a, a Jay Farrow testimonial. At the company. Thanks, Jay. Awesome. It's an insane competitive advantage, folks. Check in, check out Rim, Rimney Street. And Craig, how can they reach out to you and your team? Yeah, RimneyStreet.com is the place to go and uh, we'll get you in touch with your local rep. And uh, if we can help you out, guaranteed savings. Come on, come join us. Awesome. Hey, guys, have a great weekend. Jay. Looking forward to the update. Shokat, thanks so much. Uh, Raphael, hopefully you all can stay with us. Great. Thank you, Hunter. You're the best. Thanks, guys. Next up, we have the Innovation Accelerator, an inside look at cool new tech. Uh, first up, uh, Snail Antani. Snail is the co-founder and CEO of Horizon 3 AI. Snail, are you there? Hey, hey what's up, Hunter? Good to see you. Where are you coming in from? You coming in from your office in San Francisco? I am in San Francisco in my office with my kids' art all over the place. There you go. I love that. Hey, a little context of our relationship. I think it really is interesting to talk about the power of the platform and the network and staying connected in these very disconnected times. Snail, I remember when you were a young whippersnapper, you were at IBM, you were running cloud strategy for them, you were way ahead of the curve. And you were saying, Hunter, I love it here, but get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, you always find a way to, uh, uh, to embarrass me with, uh, with, with, with my, my young whippersnapper point of view. So let me, let me probably generalize a little bit more, which is cultivating a network of people around you that you can trust, you can lean on, you can get their opinion with no agenda is critical to anyone's career. And, you know, Hunter, you and I go back 10 years, I think at this point, 10 years, if not more. From my first CIO job, my second, my, I've had three CIO roles, being able to rely on the network throughout each of those conversations, especially as a first time CIO, where I didn't really know what I was doing, surrounded by folks that had no agenda, but just wanted to share experiences and lessons learned. And, and inversely, as I got more roles under my belt, doing the same with the network. I think at a time in crisis, when everyone is um, being pushed to work from home and stay in their bubbles, being able to keep the network to get together the way that you have has been even more valuable and even more important. But I don't think people, the good leaders appreciate the value and role of the network and, and the, the comfort and confidence that instills. And I think that the folks that don't have career success partially is due to the fact that they didn't appreciate and cultivate a network around them. Hey, thanks, Snell. And by the way, didn't mean to embarrass you, but what, what do you have, 16 or 18 patents all, uh, all in? Uh, uh, yes, I think it's 16 granted patents now. Said um, multiple CIO roles. I was a CTO at Splunk. Learned a lot about high growth business. Uh, I took a break from industry to serve in national security, which was the hardest, most meaningful work of my career. Uh, you know, guys like Moose can talk about how satisfying it is to, to work with that community. Uh, and then took the leave. I think most CIOs on the call at least dream and, and think about starting companies and uh, I, I took I took the courageous leap, if you will, to go start a company and take a risk, and and uh, now I'm a first time entrepreneur. Let's talk about Horizon Three AI. Yeah, so there's three three core problems that I had as a CIO that I know the rest of the community has. Number one is I had to meet my compliance requirements, whether it was PCI, HIPAA, CIS controls, and so on, and there was no effective way to do that. So what we do is continuous automated pen testing. And what we can do is meet those compliance requirements better, faster, and cheaper. The second problem I had was my security teams were absolutely fatigued and overwhelmed. They had way too much noise and a whole lot of problems that they needed to go fix, but those problems didn't really matter. So by running continuous pen tests, you can sift through all of that noise and find and fix problems that can actually be exploited by attackers and improve your posture. And the third thing as a CIO is I spent millions of dollars on security tools, whether it was Splunk for logging and McAfee for antivirus and so on. I had no idea if these tools were actually working and, so, and, and improving my posture. So by running continuous pen tests, I can identify my ineffective tools and processes and actually do something about it and then have the evidence to inform my board and regulators that we are in fact improving our security posture in a measurable way. So those are the three problems, right? Meet my compliance requirements, find and fix problems that actually matter, and find and fix my ineffective tools and processes to, 
to prove up and out the return on security investment. Awesome. How's it going? How's your go-to-market going and your your your, your uh, fundraising and uh, where are you? you? You only launched within the past year, right? Yeah. In fact, we launched the, the official product launched at the end of September. Um, we've already booked revenue. We are on pace to be maybe one of the fastest growing security companies to hit a uh, million dollars in ARR in just two or three months is what it looks like at the moment. But honestly, what what I think is changing in the market and back to why this form, this platform is important is companies are not going to win deals one state dinner at a time in a COVID world. And so when startups and other companies have built these massive sales teams and sales reps that are trying to get meetings, you're not going to get the cold call meetings either as a sales rep. You don't have that charm and ability to connect. So by working with you and others, our ability to build a COVID optimized sales motion, where it's all about champion building, it's about understanding intent, targeting people already interested in the technology or in the space, has allowed us to be really efficient and effective in opening, accelerating, and closing deals. That's right. And I owe you that introduction to that global CIO CISO from a multi international company in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, that's the other part. When I was a CIO and, and Ralph Bora wrote a great article about this, your time is so strapped, you, don't, you can't take in the 300 inbound emails you get from a variety of vendors, especially security companies where it's super noisy. And so what you rely on is relationship-based introductions because there's a level of credibility that comes with it. And that's where I think a year from now, you're going to see the entire sales motion change completely to not be about steak dinners and cold calls. It is going to be something very different. Excellent. Hey, we'll come back to you in just a minute with some more. Um, next up is Jim Bagwadia. Jim's the founder and CEO of Nermata. Hey, Jim, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Hi, Great. Hunter. Great to see you, my friend. Tell us a little bit about uh, Nermata, the, the space you're in, the problem you're solving, and uh, your pro uh, progress update. Absolutely. Yeah, so what Nirmata provides is a solution to bring cloud native best practices to enterprises, right? So if you kind of look uh, at what's going on today, and if you just look at the last couple of decades of IT, we started with virtualization, ran very quickly to cloud computing. And of course, that as we've heard over and over, that's accelerated in the last few months. Now the challenge becomes, how do you enable secure self-service? How do you, for your development teams, how do you enable agility while not compromising the governance, the other things we're used to in our data centers in these cloud environments? So Nirmata builds on solutions like containers, Kubernetes, which are you know, synonymous with cloud computing today. And we bring the best practices learned from several decades of hyperscalers building out these giant systems uh, to allow enterprises to easily adopt those. And where do you sell into in the enterprise, Jim? It's, it's IT operations teams. It's teams that are providing platforms to several different lines of business or product or development teams internally. So IT ops is our primary customer. And of course, the developers are the secondary customer. And what size of organization typically looks for your service offering? So it's mid to large organizations, you know, 1,000 to 5,000 employees is a starting point, but typically, as we heard from others before, the more, the larger the uh, organization, the more complex the needs. And, and that's where platforms of collaboration, uh, secure, you know, self-service, like what Nirmata offers, that really starts to resonate and shine. Now, this isn't your first uh, rodeo, right? No, so we, myself, my co-founders, we've all been in several startups before. Our background is to build centralized management planes for complex systems like in telephony, device networking, uh, mission critical 24 seven, always on systems. And today software is mission critical for every business. And, and that's the discipline we bring into that space. Excellent. So what are you looking for right now? What, do you, what kind of a prospect or customer uh, would fit your ideal mold right now? Yeah, what we've seen in just in the last few quarters is, of course, an acceleration of cloud adoption and cloud strategies, right? So as part of doing that, the ideal customer is, uh, again, a CIO and IT operations organization that's looking to enable developer agility, that's looking to do that in a secure and governed um, manner within the enterprise. 
uh, and roll out you know, the best practices, again, that can be leveraged from these cloud organizations for cost savings, for agility. Excellent. And uh, when you think of this cloud first idea or hybrid cloud, um, it's kind of a mess, right? Um, how can you help simplify that? It is complex, right? And what's happening though, some of the best, again, what we, when we see the architectures like that, the likes of Amazon and Google and others have built, uh, it's ruthless automation and standardization, right? And that's where we see today in software, you know, there's standard ways of packaging software components in containers, standard ways of, you know, doing control systems uh, with uh, technologies like Kubernetes. Uh, and a lot of these, the good thing is they're open source, community driven. So there's a lot of sort of safety and adoption of these core primary technologies uh, with a uh, high return and value. Excellent. Stay with us, Jim, we'll circle back to you. Next up, we have Andy Wang. Andy's the founder and CEO of uh, Prescient <laughs> Devices. Andy? Hey, Hunter, how are you doing? Awesome, great to see you, my friend. Same here. So a little bit about your company, Prescient, uh, Prescient Devices, and the, uh, the, the open space that you're addressing and the problem. Yes, so we are a IoT company, and uh, I'm sure everybody knows here, you know, IoT is about digital transformation for physical products and physical processes. Um, so we've been doing this thing for almost 10 years now. You know, um, at a pre previous venture, we were building IoT products for 10 years. So we see a lot of, a lot of the problems. Um, and at Pression Devices, we've been doing something that's a little bit different. So um, what happens is that um, uh, what we see is that, uh, you know, in the very near future, um, all products are going to be IoT products. Um, connectivity is going to be there. Intelligence is going to be there. Um, that's pretty obvious to everybody today. What's not very obvious is that um, in order to integrate IoT into your products or your core processes, um, it re requires internal learning and iteration. This is something that uh, the, the industry has been struggling for years. You know, initially industry thinks that, oh, we can just buy the IoT solution, which works in some cases, doesn't work for 90% of enterprises. There's a pretty well-known study that just came out this year from BCG and MIT that basically showed that today only about 10% of enterprises are truly successful with IoT and AI type of, um, type of adoption. And, uh, but if an enterprise enables internal learning, you know, which is you know, learning and evolving the, the IoT and AI solutions, that probability of success goes up to 74%. So I think this is something all enterprise AIOs to, should think about. You know, a, a success rate of 74% is way better than a success rate of 10%. The challenge now is that IoT and AI type of technology is very complex. So most enterprises are not technology companies. You know, so 90% of enterprises have trouble enabling the internal learning on these things. So this is a problem we're solving today. We built this low code IoT and AI development software which doesn't require enterprises to hire additional experts in software or hardware, just the existing IT teams. And they can evolve their IoT solutions. They can customize that IoT solutions very quickly. You know, I think we get, we get numbers such as 12X reduction in the amount of time they spend on IoT solutions and 6X reduction in cost. But more importantly, it's about an enabler technology. It enables enterprises to agilely, quickly develop, develop their own customized integration of these things. So we think it's a, it's a great thing for the industry and our customers are very excited about it because that something doesn't exist yet. So, you know, we, we certainly like to talk to uh, companies who are thinking about integrating IoT, customization, iteration, internal learning are important for them. Awesome, great job. Uh, thanks, Andy. We'll circle back to you in just a minute. Next up, we have David Walpoff, uh, co-founder and CTO of Randori. Hey, David, good to see you. Howdy, how's it going? Uh, things are uh, great. Friday, right before a big ski weekend. Not, not, can't get better than that. Yeah, if you're near the slopes, it's not a bad place to be. Right, not bad. Any mountain's fine. Any mountain anywhere is fine by me. Hey, so <laughs> getting too personal here. On the topic here, when you think of this innovation cycle, what are you doing at Randori that's uniquely different? What's the problem and issue that you're solving? Yeah, so uh, Randori is a continuous automated attack platform. Um, basically, we've built the same thing that we expect real adversaries out in the world have had. Uh, we take a little bit different tack by turning around and giving that to our customer, customers so they can kind of optimize their defenses using that adversarial lens. 
Um, and really that's kind of two primary pieces. It's all about black box and black box discovery of the assets that make up an organization. Uh, and then kind of prioritizing that through uh, that lens of an adversary. We've got customers using that mostly for attack surface management use cases. Uh, and then we follow that with an authentic attack platform, basically a whole kill chain, uh, authentic attacks, breaking in and doing all the stuff they expect adversaries to do. And then letting folks kind of uh, glean that purple experience that uh, folks have been really humming about recently. Um, and this comes from you know, my co-founder, Brian Hazard, who comes out of Carbon Black Bit9, uh, myself coming out of the kind of government services and uh, uh, commercial red teaming spaces. Just trying to bring this experience that's been out of reach to customers for a long time, that real red team, uh, adversarial, understand what's working, what's not, so that folks can kind of reduce the work that they're doing to the stuff that really matters. Interesting background. A little bit more about your, your government service. Uh, can you share a little bit more? Yeah, I spent uh, most of my career in the cleared spaces doing defense contracting stuff. I kind of started my life out as a forensics guy and ended up doing uh, offensive security and kind of learning the hacks. So it's been a wild ride for sure. Fascinating time, right? When you see, what do you see the biggest gaps holding organizations back from effectively adopted, adopting risk-based approaches to security? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I, I would point out uh, is actually just communication, right? Uh, technologists, uh, you know, CISOs, CIOs uh, don't always speak the language of business. And I think that we get wound around the axle on like what is exploitable. We tend to conflate the idea of something being exploitable uh, by an adversary as that thing being an impactful issue that we have to go address right away. Um, but in reality, uh, I might reasonably choose to let the cryptocurrency miners, uh, you know, keep running on my website because that's not actual business impact to me, right? And so when we talk about uh, being able to rationalize what matters, you need to understand what's likely, and that's got to be informed by knowing what adversaries can actually go affect something uh, against. Uh, you have to understand what matters to your business, which requires effective communication with your business. And you need to be able to figure out how your controls and your processes are actually working to glue all this stuff together. Um, Ultimately, that's a, a hard problem to, to really address, but I think if we can kind of bridge the language gap and get, you know, CISOs and CEOs being able to speak in, you know, call it dollar terms instead of uh, hacking terms, I think that'd be a really net positive thing. And then if you can frame your conversations in terms of what's actually the outcome going to be, you know, how many steps does it take for the hacker to get to the goods? Uh, those are much more constructive discussions that folks can have. Ultimately, that's where the risk lies, right? Thanks, David. You know, we've been working with CIOs, making them better effective leaders in the C-suite and the boardroom for over 30 years. Kind of kind of developed the whole idea of a CIO platform 30 years ago. And the work with CISOs for five to seven years, same idea, helping them be more effective business communicators to your, po communicators to your point. In your opinion, why has it there really been any holistic framework in place so you can really go to one-stop shopping or a series of players that line up together versus all of these point solutions. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that we're still an industry that sells on fear uh, as opposed to kind of selling on hope and vision. Um, and I think that ultimately, you know, risk management and cyber is pretty new, right? You saw academic papers in 2000, but really the name of the game has been risk elimination and silver bullets for kind of the you know, last 20 years. And it's really only very recently that you've seen big business CEOs starting to transition to the language of risk in this particular domain. Um, so I think it's just early. I think you're going to start seeing a lot more platforms as you see, you know, compliance management frameworks, you know, intelligence platforms, uh, you know, threat emulation, attack platforms kind of all come together on these, you know, kind of big questions and help people actually converge the data to a single place. Okay. And size of company and funding, where, where, are, you, where are you at right now? Yeah. So we are a series A. Uh, so we're a couple of years in at this point, 30 million in funding. Uh, we're just going a million miles an hour at this point. Uh, you know, about 30 folks working on the company now. That's been an incredible ride here. Congratulations. Awesome job. We'll circle back to you here in just a minute. Hey, Snell, back to you, my friend. When you think about what's next in your go-to-market, um, who do you want to meet and how can we help? Um, you, know, you know, back to this idea of COVID-optimized sales and so on. There's, um, and you can go back to the original problem statement. As a CIO, what, what problems are consuming my time that I have to go address? You know, we talk about compliance. I, no matter what, I have to go uh, uh, do compliance activities. It's already in my budget. I have to, to execute security assessments to meet PCI requirements, to meet HIPAA requirements, to deliver on federal regulatory reasons and so on. And so CIOs that have to do this, they've already created the budget 
and they want to get it done better, faster, cheaper, that is low hanging fruit for us. Um, our ability to one click be able to hit that, hit that issue. And the reason why is in, in a world where you've got revenue uncertainty like we have right now, I don't think we're seeing a lot of new budget line items being created. So step one is how do we help provide immediate relief to you? Because what we're finding with our customers, honestly, and it's pretty sad is I can either spend a quarter million dollars buying another security tool, or I can use that money to prevent one more person from being laid off. And so you're not gonna see new budget being created, I think for a, for a little bit of while or for a little bit of time. So how do we provide that immediate relief and how do we target um, those executive leaders that have these requirements, they have to do it and they can use this to do it said better, faster, cheaper. Outside of that, the next tier of, of customers are those that are overwhelmed or need to prove their return on investment. That's a much bigger group of folks, but I think that first immediate group is you have to do security assessments, you're under budget pressure, um, you're tired of hiring consultants, come talk to us so that we can get it done for you more effectively. Excellent, and can you help with more strategic overlay that David touched on? Yeah, um, that's the secondary conversation, right? You know, Chris Krebs, who was recently fired from DHS has this great quote, defend today, secure tomorrow, and do what you can to defend, to stop yourself from from getting breached and having reputational risk or financial risk right now. And with the sudden move to work from home and so on, where your employee's Netflix password is probably their corporate email password, and this increase in VPN attacks and this new uh, attack service you weren't prepared for and none of your defensive products are tuned for, I think that CIOs and CISOs, CISOs are scrambling to just defend today. And so let's deliver that Tylenol to that headache first. And now, and after the dust settles, let's talk about securing tomorrow, which gets into supply chain risk management, vendor risk management, continuous security assessments, uh, and improving your tools and processes for in a more strategic way. Hey, it's now a great job. How can people get in touch with you and the team, Monty, at, uh, at, at Horizon 3? Yep. So uh, horizon3.ai is the URL. Um, easy to find through the HMG network, uh, easy to find through LinkedIn. Uh, but horizon3.ai is, is probably the best way to get at least to the website, if not the LinkedIn page. Hey, uh, best of luck. Congratulations on the, on the success. Thank you. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, you know, back over to Jim. Hey, Jim, when you think of uh, the type of tech leader that you want to meet um, and the size of company, um, let me know. I'd love to make some introductions. That sounds good. Yeah, then like I mentioned, you know, leaders looking to kind of accelerate the cloud migration for applications and, you know, adopt um, these type of principles, best practices, that, that's our ideal fit. Do you have a white paper uh, or a case study that you can forward along to me? Yes, we do. We have several, you know, hybrid cloud as well as customer case studies. I will definitely send that over. Okay. And uh, Andy, same thing with you. Um, any kind of white paper that you have or a customer's a case study that you can support along to me? Yes, we do. We have several web papers on our website. We also have very good blog articles on detailing why, you know, what we do makes sense, why this internal iteration is important. So please go to our website, uh, same as the company name. Okay, uh, excellent. And uh, uh, David, same to you as well. Um, case studies, white papers, you might be able to forward along to me, Hunter M at HMG Strategy. Yeah, for sure. As long as you're giving out your uh, email address on the, the call here get everybody sending you emails. Uh, yeah, website spelled like the t-shirt, uh, also in the name. We've got a bunch of interesting use cases. We got some white papers, all sorts of supporting materials. Um, I'd like to do a white, I'd like to do a, an article on this, uh, uh, our program here, folks, and, and get kind of quotes from each one of you around kind of a problem opportunity and a point of view and the kind of clients you're looking for all like in a, in a tight four to eight sentence kind of a model uh, we have a listserv of over half a million uh, that will put a wrapper around it and blast it to the network and then uh, including your URL in that article as well. If you're all in, uh, simple thumbs up. That's great. Um, we do this. We've been doing this for uh, this model for this company for 14 years, but it's an idea I had over 30 years ago. True story. I gave the idea to Gideon Gartner. He didn't want it but it took me another 20, 15, 20 years to launch it. Uh, we're in our 14th year. We've grown organically for uh, 14 years, year over year, 20 to hundred percent year over year. But it's all about elevating the IT leader, a practitioner, 
towards success and brilliance in the line of business, the C-suite and the board, and elevating our partner companies. All of you all, we'd like to help you uh, in that journey and uh, and leverage our platform. So Sneha has been around for, we've been collaborating for 12 years, and I think he'd probably agree that it's the way to go, right, Sneha? Yeah, absolutely. As I said, um, that 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 champion-based uh, sales, trust-based introductions is critical to cutting through the noise to to find highly qualified opportunities. And said for for you know for the for the three other founders over here, I'm sure you're already you're dealing with this, but uh, how do you build a highly qualified pipeline with as little cost as possible is critical to success of any companies, and uh, the network and the HMG platform is a force multiplier in your ability to get highly qualified opportunities with um, way less effort than other methods. Thanks, Sneha. Hey, Jim, great to see you. Andy, great to meet you. Uh, David, great to meet you. I'm looking forward to many more exchanges. Sneha, have a great weekend. Always good to see you. And I see Jay Farrow still there. Jay, great to see you there, my friend. Uh, the, to the research team, August Pelicio, great job. We did over 3 million uh, views in our, uh, our, our our social media feed in the last 12 months. Great job, August. And uh, what a great program, folks. A big shout out to Arctic Wolf, um, Rimini Street, and Espresso. Pat coming in from uh, Asia. Uh, and I think just another brilliant summit here, folks. I Hopefully everyone got something out of this. Uh, thanks to Shokat, Ken Russell, and all the other speakers, our search panel executives that we almost always have a search panel involved with our uh, network and you never know when you're going to need a search executive and uh, for them to pick up the phone. So stay close to HMG, stay close to a winning idea, a winning attitude. And uh, by the way, wasn't David Bray excellent? Thanks, folks. Have a great weekend. Uh, August, you want to come out, please? Hey, Hunter, how are you today? Great. Final item, August. Uh, big shout out to the Atlanta Sim chapter, right? And our other partners and uh, the Top 2020 Global Technology Executives of Matter Recognition Program, right? Correct, right. So we're recognizing one really great IT executive today, Lee Crump. Uh, I know Lee signed out in the beginning of the program, watched the whole show today. Good to see you, Lee. How are you? I'm good, August. Thank you. So a little bit of background uh, about Lee for everybody. He's the Group Vice President of IT at Rollins. Lee's been a really great friend of HMG for years, and we've had the opportunity to see how dedicated he is to this field, how loyal he is to his brand, uh, his organization, and his team. He stepped up to bat with Rollins almost 12 years ago, and he directs a department of over 150 IT managers, right? Um, before Rollins, Lee spent nine years as the CIO and VP at Terminix, uh, where he built up their IT systems in a way that aided growing their business from a $600 million to $1.1 billion in revenue. Lee masterfully leverages courage, honesty, integrity, uh, and uh, integrity of intent to motivate his teams and his partners to deliver results. Um, Lee has been honing his authentic and driven leadership style for what, 40 years? Outside of his professional uh, career, his impressive professional career, he utilizes his leadership medal to give back to the world. For the last six years, he's been a mentor and board member for Year Up uh, in their Atlanta community. Year Up is one of our most valued nonprofit partners uh, for the community give back at HMG. So we're all always inspired by our friends and colleagues who contribute to their outstanding mission. Lee, congratulations on earning this honor for yourself and your team. And I'll hand it over to Hunter now. I know that you've been a great friend of HMG's. Yeah, Lee, I can't believe it. It seems like it's been so quick, but over a decade collaborating and working together over 12 years, 14 years in the Atlanta market, you've been a steady uh, thought leader and uh, a guide for us all over the years. And I really appreciate your active engagement, commitment to the network and commitment to the ideal of what leadership's all about in our industry. I can't think of a better uh, recipient today than you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the uh, recognition and uh, uh, I really appreciate, Hunter, everything you do for the community as well. Thank you. Awesome. Great job. Uh, hopefully you can attend the program next year, the 2020 program. We'll, get, we'll, get, we'll give you a heads up. Now, hopefully we'll be in person, right? Right. That's right. <laughs> 
Well, hey, everyone, be safe, take care, great summit. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed it. Uh, please give any feedback to me directly at HunterM at HMGStrategy.com or on LinkedIn. Uh, until next time, be safe and lead on with courage. Thanks, guys.